Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, I am the Director of Early Childhood Development at RTI and a co-lead of RTI's Center for Thriving Children alongside Betsy Jordan Bell. Um, as you're joining, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, share your name, maybe where you're joining from, your affiliation if you'd like to share that. Um, the Center for Thriving Children at RTI is a multidisciplinary team internally that is collaborating on research and practice to advance inclusive early childhood development. And our center is very happy to host the, today's webinar, uh, Supporting Caregivers of Children with Disabilities, our lessons from uh, research in Cambodia. And before we dive into the research, uh, we're going to begin with some brief welcoming remarks from Cami Spangenberg, who is our Senior Vice President for Corporate Communications, Scientific Stature Services, and Community Affairs here at RTI. Over to you, Cami. Thanks so much, Catherine. Hello, and I'd like to welcome all of you on behalf of RTI International to today's webinar. RTI is an independent nonprofit research institute that has implemented both research and programming for many sectors of the U.S. government since our founding in 1958. Researchers across RTI have contributed to global knowledge in many areas related to early childhood development, including on newborn screening and early identification, early intervention, and family support. But RTI staff don't only conduct research. Our mission as an institute is to turn knowledge into practice, seeking to implement evidence-based interventions with the goal of improving the human condition. RTI recognizes early childhood as a critical window of opportunity to support caregivers, families, communities, and societies to establish strong foundations for future generations. RTI's Center for Thriving Children brings together researchers and practitioners from diverse fields and disciplines to advance healthy development and well-being for all young children. In Cambodia, RTI is privileged to lead the implementation of USAID's Integrated Early Childhood Development, IECD program. Through that program, we seek to improve the lives and development potential of children in rural areas of Cambodia. By now you may be curious about why I am speaking with you today. Personally, I am very passionate about work that enables persons with disabilities to live their best lives. Last month, I had the opportunity to visit Cambodia and to witness our work firsthand. Our group visited the Physical Rehabilitation Center in Kampong Tong province. While there, we witnessed therapists working with children with disabilities and their caregivers. It was incredibly inspiring and an impactful experience. One of the therapists shared that a young toddler with cerebral palsy had recently learned to stand up on his own because of the therapies received. Seeing that happy toddler in action, pulling himself up and reaching out to his mother for a hug is something I will never forget. It was a true example of what it means to help children, all children thrive. That was an intervention that worked. Since we are a research institute, we seek to discover if our interventions are working. So alongside the IECD program, we are conducting a longitudinal cluster randomized controlled trial. This study is tracking 1,790 caregivers and their young children to document changes in the caregivers' attitudes, behaviors, and practices while measuring the children's development status. As a nonprofit institute, RTI conducts a competitive process each year to invest internal funds in studies proposed by staff. The study that you are hearing about today called Reaching Their Full Potential represents one of those studies. While this study was inspired by and leveraged from some data from the IECD project, this study was entirely funded by RTI. RTI is committed to localization, and it was important to us that the finding of, findings of this study were shared in Cambodia with country stakeholders. Mr. Huang Hiem, whom you will hear from shortly, served as the study co-principal investigator in Cambodia. And he and my colleague, Betsy Jordan Bell, shared the results of this study over the course of a half-day workshop in Cambodia in September. 
Almost 50 people participated in that meeting, including representatives from two Cambodian government ministries, from civil society organizations, and key leaders from national and regional hospitals. During today's webinar, we will hear from my colleague, Claire Brennan, about the findings of the research, the knowledge generated by this study. And from Mr. Hong Hyum, we will hear about necessary steps, just as RTI's mission states, to turn that knowledge into practice. Thank you again for joining us today. Great, thanks so much, Cami. Um, we were thrilled to have a huge number of people register for this webinar, and I think it it signals a recognition among those who are committed to improving outcomes for young children that achieving that goal depends on how well societies are supporting caregivers. Um, we know that caregivers of children with disabilities face additional challenges and are ad under additional stress, and we'll see that in some of our data presented today. Um, in the past, many children with disabilities landed in orphanages, and many countries, including Cambodia, have rightly moved away from that practice to close orphanages and allow children, including those with disabilities, to live at home with their families. But in many countries, little or no support has been provided to help caregivers best care for their children at home. So the question becomes, how can caregivers of young children with disabilities be supported to provide excellent care for their children at home? What is the responsibility of governments to help those caregivers in that role? Um, and as a bit of further background, as Cami mentioned, this study is um, was funded by RTI, but it runs adjacent to a program that is funded by USAID called um, the Integrated Early Childhood Development Activity, IECD. Uh, so if you hear that acronym, that's what that is referring to. Um, and we're pleased to have from USAID, Kat Kirk from the Children and Adversity Office, uh, who will comment after the presentation and just share some reflections um, from her perspective on what, she, what we're talking about today. Uh, and then just one more administrative note that we have a report to share on this study, and that is just being polished for publication today, and we'll be sharing it as along together with the recording of this webinar um, in the coming week. So um, be on the lookout for that written report that accompanies this recording. Um, Next, we're gonna hear from Claire Brennan, who is a senior research specialist at RTI, and she'll be presenting the study design and results. Um, and then we're going to hear from Him Hong, our, the president of the Cambodia Physical Therapy Association. So he was a co-investigator on this study, as Cami mentioned. Um, we did take a recording of Hung's presentation just in case the internet lapsed in the middle. We didn't wanna lose him. So we're gonna play a recording, but he is also with us in person now, so he'll be a available to answer questions during our Q&A. Um, so we'll, we will have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, and you're welcome to put your questions into the chat. And now I'll pass it over to Claire. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Hi, um, my name is Claire Brennan. And along with Heem Hung and Betsy Jordan Bell, I co-led this study that we're talking about today, the Reaching Their Full Potential study. And I also want to acknowledge Kanika Noon and Elizabeth Marsden, who were also critical um, to the study design and implementation. And I'm excited to tell you all about our findings. Um, next slide, please. So first, why are we focusing on caregivers of children with disabilities? Catherine did a great job framing this. Um, we know that children with disabilities require additional time and resources to ensure they can reach their full developmental potential. But despite improved policies in many countries, children with disabilities um, around the world are at greater risk of poverty, they're less likely to start and continue schooling. And while countries uh, are rightly emphasizing keeping children with their families rather than placing them in orphanages or institutions, it really isn't clear how those families are being supported to care for their children. Next slide. So we had three objectives with this study. The first was to further global knowledge about the interventions that best support caregivers, families, and communities to optimize outcomes for children with disabilities. We also wanted to better understand the experiences of families with children with disabilities, including their resilience capacities and their needs. And finally, we hope to better understand how families with children with disabilities use and adapt the components of nurturing care, which are shown there in the figure to the right, 
to support their children to thrive. Um, next slide. So this was a mixed method study. We administered a quantitative survey to a convenient sample of 58 caregivers of children with disabilities, and we conducted, <clears throat> excuse me, qualitative in-depth interviews with 15 of those caregivers. We also created a comparison group of caregivers of children without disabilities from an existing population level data set and match them to our study group based on their location, the age of their child, and other demographic variables. And finally, we conducted key informant interviews with 11 local service providers and stakeholders. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, thank you. So a quick look at the demographics of the caregivers in our study. Um, the caregivers were located primarily in Kampong Tom province. Nearly all were female and about half could read and write. The majority of the caregivers stayed at home uh, or were farmers. And of course the comparison group of caregivers of children without disabilities had nearly identical demographic characteristics um, as intended. Next slide. The children that our caregivers were responsible for had a variety of disabilities. Cerebral palsy was the most common condition. Um, children also had vision, hearing, or speech problems, which were not expected to be resolved with surgeries or other adaptive devices. Um, autism, Down syndrome, and some other conditions as well. The major majority of the children were 24 months or older, uh, but all were under five, so between two and five years old. Um, next slide. So now I'll get a little bit into the study findings, starting with the challenges that caregivers of children with disabilities faced. Next slide. Thanks. So the first challenge uh, is time requirements. As you would expect, caring for a child with a disability requires more time and effort from the caregiver to help the child move, eat, and communicate. And we have a quote here from a mother explaining what is required for her to care for her child. She says, caring is very difficult. He cannot sit up. We have to carry him all the time if we want to take him out of bed. We also have to change his position as he cannot roll by himself. Uh, next slide. Feeding challenges, um, feeding children with disabilities also requires extra time and effort and was another challenge for many of the caregivers. About half of the survey respondents said their children don't want to eat, that swallowing liquids or solids or coughing is a problem. And many said their children don't gain weight because of these issues. In qualitative interviews, our caregivers described various adaptations to help their children eat. Uh, for example, in the quote here, a caregiver describes feeding her child. She says, the child likes rice with her eggs, but we need to blend her food. She cannot swallow rice without blending. We have to make it soft and smooth. She can swallow, but she eats only a few spoons at a time and she chokes easily. Next slide. Um, financial strain was another major challenge reported by nearly every caregiver of a child with a disability in our study. 95% of caregivers households had no financial savings and over 60% of the caregivers said that their family had faced financial strain due to their child's disability. And caring for a child with a disability created this financial strain in two main ways. It impacts the household's ability to earn income and it also creates additional financial needs. Um, this quote from a mother of a child with autism uh, who also has seizures talks about both of these concerns. She says her child's disability affects mainly on their income generation and we spend a lot of money taking care of him. There is no other choice rather than taking him to work with me. And when he is sick, we take him to the hospital. But sometimes both of us cannot go to work because we are too worried about him. Many participants spoke about not being able to afford health care, medication, or transportation to access services for their child, and especially to access rehabilitation services, which are located far from their homes. Key informants uh, in the study acknowledge these challenges as well. They recognize that the opportunity cost of missing a day or more of work made it hard for families to seek even routine care, much less those specialized services. Uh, furthermore, caregivers reported low levels of participation in social protection programs. Of the 58 caregivers, only one family had a disability card for their child, which would entitle that child to free health care and other benefits. And under half of our sample had the ID poor or equity cards uh, which Hung will talk about a bit more later on. 
Um, next slide, please. So unsurprisingly, caregivers reported high levels of emotional stress. They experienced tension with their partners, isolation, worry, and strain resulting from their child's disability. Um, notably, less than half of caregivers of children with disabilities felt they could leave their child with their spouse or another family member and take a break when they were tired. So they felt like they were always on, always on duty. Um, another stress factor for some participants was stigma and a lack of community support. Some said that people in their communities avoided their family because of the child's disability, and several were told to put their child in an institution or to stop spending resources on the child. For example, um, this mother said, I do not have supporting people, only those who ask me to abandon my child. They say, stop caring for him. You've been caring for him for three or four years, and still he's not cured. Just take him to an orphanage. Um, next slide. So um, after all those challenges, I'd like to talk about some of the caregivers' strengths and skills. Next slide, please. And the first one that I wanna mention is the love and commitment these caregivers have for their children. The caregivers in our sample overwhelmingly said they enjoy spending time with their child and that they are determined to continue caring for their child. For example, this mother spoke about her reaction to negative comments that she received from folks in her community. She said that they tell her not to take care of your daughter because of her problem. They say, how long can she survive? But the mother responds, she is my daughter. If I am poor or it is difficult, I have to care for her. What those other people say is up to them. Uh, next slide, please. The caregivers um, of children with disabilities in our sample utilized numerous coping strategies to deal with the challenges that they face. You can see here in this um, slide that many try to get advice or help from others are taking action to improve their situation and that they also seek emotional support from others. Critically, many of them are actively trying to come up with a strategy to improve their circumstances so they are ready for action. And while some blame themselves for their child's disability, none reported uh, alcohol or substance use to cope. So we do see that these caregivers are trying to take care of themselves and are highly motivated to improve the lives of their children and families. Next slide, please. Um, equally important is that these caregivers report high levels of self-efficacy. You can see here in this graph that they believe in themselves to be able to handle the situation they're in and also to improve their family's circumstances. Caregivers were confident that they can solve difficult problems, deal with unexpected events, and handle whatever comes their way. And many know that they are able to stay calm in tough situations, which I think we can all agree is not easy, even under the very best of circumstances. Next slide, please. Um, and finally, we see that caregivers of children with disabilities are really doing an exceptional job of providing nurturing care to their children. You can see that they play with their children, sing songs, and provide early learning opportunities at similar levels, or in some cases, uh, even more than the caregivers in the comparison group. So the caregivers with disabilities here are in light blue and dark blue is the comparison group. Um, and really the story that this data is telling us is that caring for a child with a disability uh, in these parts of Cambodia is really difficult. And there are countless challenges and strains and stresses on the caregivers. But at the same time, caregivers are really strong. They are resilient and they have they believe in themselves. They have a variety of coping strategies and adaptations. And they use all of those skills and strengths to take really good care of their children and uh, support their children to thrive. So thank you. Now I'll hand it off to Mr. Heem Hung to talk about the implications of the study findings in Cambodia. Thank you. OK, as you can see, my name is uh, Heem Hung. I'm working for the Cambodian Physiotherapy Association. So it's my great pleasure to be here and uh, to present the application for policy and practice parts of the study. I'd like to talk about what the government is doing in Cambodia. So actually, the government of Cambodia has signed have tried the UN Convention on the right of 4% USD in 2012. They're also the member of the WHO on the specialist focus on the rehabilitation 2030, that uh, the country has to 
adopt some policy and strategy for adaptation. Government also have uh, developed a number of strategy, policy, and framework to provide and care for uh, disability in, in Cambodia, including children with disability. A number of points that I want to share in this uh, part, the coverage of healthcare costs. To that, uh, children with disability uh, should assess free healthcare service uh, in the government setting if they had a card. However, now uh, we see that there are some uh, gap in terms of insurance that uh, it doesn't cover children uh, under 18 if they don't have works. And uh, children, if they don't have a CD card, they may miss out uh, when they are uh, taking to the hospital or have their service uh, because the behavior of the service providers, sometimes they know, they sometimes they depend uh, not to know that children with disability or possibility should assess service without uh, payments. The coverage costs associated with seeking healthcare in Cambodia. Uh, children with disability uh, actually have some support if they are going to the rehabilitation center. I'm not talking about the hospital. That uh, They should receive food and transport system support from the government. So usually the transport system support is about $2.5. Food is about only uh, $0.75, so less than $1. So the remaining gap for this part is the money that supporting is very small. And uh, they have to top up with their own pocket money. And uh, also, because of the, the budget from the government supporting to the rehabilitation uh, limited, now the management and the rehabilitation centers try to cut out uh, the uh, food allowance. So what they do, they do not have the dormitory for uh, service user, including children with city and their parents or caregivers. Therefore, if they don't stay in the uh, dormitory, they do not get the food allowance. However, they still get the uh, transport system. Before, it used to have, uh, it used to support all the, the user that come to use the service and stay at, in the dormitory. But now, because of the fund limits, they, they don't have this, uh, this support. For income replacement, uh, under the family uh, pay cake, support, so the full family should in fact to receive healthcare free uh, of charge, and they should receive uh, $7, that is the rule. The gap is that if they don't have the PCT uh, card, which is now very limited, they only provide to, uh, I think only maybe less than half now in, in the country. So more than half, they still don't have the card. They not entitled to this fund support. So, so that is the challenge. Uh, also, this uh, support in terms of uh, assessment and identifying children or this disability in the country is very slow, and this mm, may be due to the behavior and also the process, bureaucracy of assessing of the disability in the country. For strengthening of the capacity uh, of the healthcare uh, and healthcare system, I think uh, now it's a good start that uh, the government decide to transfer the health system from the Mosby to, to the MOA, Ministry of Social Affairs and Ministry of to Ministry of Health. From this so MOH now, they start to work on uh, improving some of the policy and material for the SWIFT provision, uh, including the uh, women's repackage activity and uh, other strategies that can
can promote the diversity in the health system as well. Uh, in identification, uh, there are two initiatives. So one is the pool we call CDMAT or CDMAT, uh, long version and short version. Uh, now it's used by a number of NGO or program in the country, like the uh, IECD uh, project before they are used by the Hong Kong Children's Hospital and a number of local NGO and international NGO as well to identify uh, this tea in, in, the, in the community, especially children from zero to five years old. Also, under the Ministry of Health, they have a screening tool protocol uh, can screen the newborn at all the health settings. The other gap is also in terms of the responsibility of the uh, transition that I just mentioned earlier, it uh, takes a long time. Uh, we expected it, but uh, for so when it remained under the question. So for sharing with you now, uh, honestly, uh, it seemed like the Ministry of Social Affairs, they don't want to let the rehabilitation suite to the MOH. But yeah, that, that's what I can see I made up. But uh, that's what uh, is, is, is really happened here. So yeah, hopefully they can find a way to transfer the adaptation speed to the knowledge as soon as possible. In uh, the MPA and CPA that I just said is guideline and the policy for the hospital and uh, health center service. Uh, now they include the adaptation uh, sector into this uh, document. So once it is validated, finished, this it become official, and this can use a, a tool to uh, lobby for funds from the Ministry of Government and uh, Finance. So hopefully, uh, there will be some fund from the government allocated to the rehabilitation under the health system uh, straight away after the. Uh, policy, the guideline will, will be complete and introduced for use. Uh, regarding workforce, oh, this is very important. Uh, in Cambria, regarding caring of children with this tea, so uh, rehabilitation service, we have like physiotherapy, process and autosis. So we have, we have some of the professional, but we don't have OT, we don't have speech therapy, we don't have medical doctor who have the specialized in, in rehabilitation. So that's big gap. And also we don't have like uh, yeah, social work that have really skill in this uh, area. So the government's now considering in invest on, on this, but uh, again, we don't know how and, and when it will, it will uh, come to life. It will be, uh, enough workforce for disability service in terms of caring of children with disability, especially in the community. For example, like even though that we have like now physiotherapy can provide the service to children with disability in community and in the in the adaptation center in hospital, but it's still like the number is very low. You know? uh, now we have one physiotherapy for 30 to 33,000 population. This compare with like uh, Thailand, Malaysia, they have like one piece of for six, six to seven thousand population, and in Japan it's about one thousand nine hundred like that. So it's still very big, gap. and uh, CPTA did analyze it as well that if the government now it can enroll up to three hundred uh, these other piece for their study for the uh, professional required graduate. Then uh, it takes 15 years to meet like uh, one piece of therapy for 10,000 uh, population. So that it, it will be take a long time to provide good care. I, I just give you in terms of uh, what is the gate perspective in terms of uh, uh, workforce. Assistive technology, oh, this is also chronic as well, uh, especially for, for wheelchair. Now we, we have like, uh, one program, uh, it's called AT Scale, uh, that is part mobility device and uh, visual assistive. This uh, fund from 
uh, UN OPS and it's uh, planned for five years. So this is uh, under the Ministry of Health as well. And actually it's an uh, inter-ministry because this fund is only available for health and, and uh, not for the uh, social uh, department or, or ministry. So that's why I think it's linked back to the uh, information that I said, if the rehabilitation service is to is transferred to the health system that we do. The big gap I, I just said, is, uh, in terms of assistive device, we have um, limited in, in number, especially like wheelchairs. Um, under the ISD, I just take example, I, uh, uh, during the field visit, I interviewed the caregiver of the children under the project. Also, a lot of children that they need wheelchair. Uh, so among the uh, 20, uh, yeah, 26, 27, so uh, 19, 19 of them need wheelchair, but only one have the wheelchair. So that is very important. And without wheelchair, uh, the children just uh, really struggling and the caregiver really struggling to care and they cannot sit upright, they cannot uh, care them well in feeding, in uh, washing, bathing, all of this. And the quality of, of, of life are really not so good. And also in terms of uh, moving uh, inside and outside the home as well. So that is the, the big challenge. And also we know that in Cambodia, the supply chain of the technology, assistive technology is uh, not really uh, considered yet. Of course, we have uh, one factory in Cambodia, but they use like uh, only uh, limited numbers. They, they only provide based on the budget from the government and donors. So they cannot meet the need of children with disability. We are not talking about all the disability in Cambodia. So supporting a caregiver, uh, now, I mean, in Cambodia, we have the uh, guideline on the community based adaptation uh, under the MOSFI, the Ministry of Social Affairs, but it seems like uh, not really uh, active. Uh, the network used to work together under the international organization now uh, they close uh, only a few NGO local NGO or international NGO that they still run uh, community based there there is a big problem for uh, people in the community that they should receive the uh, community based support for support in terms of home adaptation uh, teaching and training of the caregiver in the communities. So, like for example, in India, in Pakistan, in Nepal, they found it all very useful, and they are like the role models uh, in terms of supporting to children with the in the community. But we we don't have that, and and it is uh, the issue in that as well. If the rehabilitation transfer to MOH, MOH maybe it uh, initiate in terms of community action because the service is now uh, at the uh, health center and in the health center program they also have a community service but now it's focused on the uh, vaccination and uh, health education but in the mpa i, I just said i just said earlier a guideline for uh, health centers we include some of the rehabilitation service including the children with sub t uh, like cerebral palsy spinal cord injury particularly blood food yeah, some of these, but even this uh, document has uh, adopted and introduced to the uh, health center quite a long, uh, two or three years already, but the activity seems like it's never happened on, on their rehabilitation. So if the budget is allocated from the government for that, I think uh, probably the act activity can start and you can see uh, some initiation from that as well. The gap uh, in terms of the uh, support from the community, actually we have the uh, P 
people, the local authority that have the volunteer, that they have the uh, support team in the community. But uh, these people, they don't have the money. So that it's important to work with them, train them, collaborate with them to identify children with disability, to uh, provide some knowledge about caring, and be a network to support family and children with disability in the community. And uh, also the connection of the caregiver and caregiver that is really important as well. To one, maybe to make them aware of the service in the community or in different place that may be important for their children. For example, like uh, in the case of uh, autism, children with autism, oh, in Cambodia, we don't have the service at the commune levels. And if they have good network, uh, some parent that they assess the service somewhere in Phnom Penh or uh, regional, they may uh, be able to explain and send or share the information with other caregivers as well. So thank you very much uh, uh, with these uh, people that have the uh, research. Uh, mostly that we have the uh, data collector and also the uh, committee team for this study. So yeah. thank you for very much for your uh, participation. Thanks, everybody. Um, so thank, we've just had a presentation from Hung, and I'm now going to pass it over to Kat Kirk. Kat is a senior advisor in the Children and Adversity Office at USAID, and she supports some programming in Cambodia. Um, and we'd love to hear Kat's reflections on the presentation. Over to you, Kat. Thanks, Catherine, and thanks, Hong and Claire, for sharing the results of this important study. I'm pleased to be joining you all today from Cambodia, where I've had an opportunity to spend time with the staff from the Integrated Early Childhood Development Activity and others, um, as well as families of children with disabilities here in Cambodia. And I think it's so important that we really listen to and understand the needs of children with disabilities in their families to inform the appropriate supports that these children need to be able to fully participate in their communities, to live in nurturing family environments, and ultimately to thrive. I think these study results show the love and commitment of these parents, especially mothers, to the care and support for their children, but also the numerous barriers that they face from caregiving burdens to support children's activities of daily living, stigma in their own communities, financial strains, and stress and worry. In far too many places, services for children with disabilities and their families are incredibly limited. And globally, we know from recent data that children with disabilities experience fewer opportunities for play, though it was heartened to see that was not the case for these children and their families. But children with disabilities also experience higher rates of malnutrition, early mortality, and much higher odds of family separation. These inequities are driven mainly by societal barriers that limit their full participation in society, and they're truly unacceptable. For the children, it means we need to think about what are the supports that a child may need, whether that's inclusive education, starting in their early years, rehabilitation services, but also, as Hung so nicely laid out, the multi-sectoral supports from social protection, parent and peer support, health, rehabilitation, and other areas to support these families and their children to have optimal health and well-being. I've seen in my own experience working with children with disabilities and their families how powerful peer support can be to provide a sense of hope and belonging for caregivers. These types of supports are critical everywhere, but they're even more critical as we work towards the long-term goal of ensuring that we have inclusive social protection, education, health, and other systems that are truly able to respond to the needs of children and their families. And I think, Hong, you laid out so nicely um, the progress that's been happening to date and the many of positive steps that are happening to provide supports, but also the long journey that we have to go and are working together to achieve. Inclusion and ensuring adequate support for children with disabilities and their families is a critical aspect of the U.S. government strategy on advancing protection and care for children in adversity, which aims to ensure that children everywhere have strong beginnings through supporting optimal child development, are raised in loving family-based care, and are protected from violence. 
This strategy is in the process of being updated and will be released later um, this year with even greater attention to the needs of children with disabilities. The Global Trial Thrive Act is another initiative of the United US government, which was passed just a couple years ago, which further emphasized our commitment to inclusive and integrated supports to um, supporting young children's development. Programs like the Integrated Early Childhood Development Activity in Cambodia are an example of how we are trying to operationalize this mandate to support children with disabilities and their families at USAID. In addition, USAID is in the process of updating their disability policy, and the U.S. Basic Education Strategy was just released, which further emphasized commitments to inclusive education and supporting access to education services for children with disabilities starting in the early years. I think this study provides really important insights to think about how we can advance initiatives to support these children and families. And I just wanna really thank the team at RTI and Hong and others who contributed to um, helping us learn from these families and uh, look forward to hearing more in the questions and answers. So back to you, Catherine, thank you. Great, thanks so much, Kat. Um, okay, now we have um, about 20 minutes for questions for our panelists, and I'd encourage everybody to put your questions into the chat. Um, I'm just going to read one, which um, is the first that my eyes are falling upon, that may be more of a comment than a question. If rehabilitation service and other disability support services are incorporated into the health center, this is really helpful for all children with disabilities and contributes to promoting family-based care. Um, and I think that point about incorporation into the health center is an important one. And I'm wondering, Hung, if maybe you could talk a little bit more in your slides. You mentioned that responsibility for these services is transitioning from MOSAVI to Ministry of Health. And I wonder if you could comment about kind of what that transition means in practice, what will the Ministry of Health be taking on, um, and just other thoughts you could share about the integration of these services with ongoing regular health care. Thank you very much. Uh, yep. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to answer to the question. Uh, so I, I also chat to the Baba <laughs> Thank you. Actually, uh, the government now try to uh, transfer the service, the rehabilitation service only from the Ministry of Social Affairs to the Ministry of Health, which is uh, following the gu guideline of the WHO, we call the rehabilitation 2030. But the other DCP issue is not uh, transferring, it's still under the Ministry of Social Affairs including family care, family uh, support, uh, uh, maybe some of the social aspects as well that uh, still related with this ministry. Is, uh, I think some country, maybe you have like social affairs and health together like in Japan and other country. So that is, that's good, but we have separate ministries. So the Ministry of Social Affairs still take care of this issue. And they also there responsible for implementation of the UN CRPD and also the national law on this TRIS fair. I hope I answered your question. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm seeing another one in the chat here. How is the higher education sector, this is a great question, being engaged to help address some of the human resource challenges to providing services and support to children with disabilities and their families? So this is the getting at the workforce piece and maybe back to you, Hung, on this one. Thank you again, <laughs> that's my question. And uh, uh, today I also have another workshop discussing about this, this hot issue. Uh, we understand that Cambodia is like a low resource country and also of course in terms of the human resource. Because of, we have other agenda to have, the government also has limited budget for supporting this. So regarding uh, high education in Cambodia, of course uh, we have uh, physiotherapy, we have uh, proceed auto -sick, and we have some of the other professional like nurse and all of this social uh, work as well. But the number is still very correctly limited uh, in terms of professional. 
and uh, also in terms of funding support project in community as well. So we still limit uh, in terms of helping people in the community, whilst now also we have the issue in terms of uh, having enough support from the festival as well. Because uh, even the government at the local level, they have structure from very low, we call village to the commune or some kind. And we have in health system, we have uh, health centers at the very uh, low levels. And at the commune uh, council, they have the social department to support this area. But like I said in my presentation, that those people, they, they don't have the skill in terms of caring for children with disability and other uh, support, social support as well. So that is still a challenge. And I think the work of the uh, one of the uh, National Institute for Social Work collaborated with UNICEF now, they try to train uh, local people, the volunteer and uh, community council to develop some of the uh, social work support. So hopefully uh, now they have some of the resource the local level, but not from the higher education. Okay, Thanks. great, thank you. Um, we had another question from Karen in the chat. Is there any funding going to the Ministry of Education to support the education of children with disabilities? And I'll just say, Karen, that, that, that this study didn't focus particularly on the work of the Ministry of Education. Um, my understanding is that the Ministry of Education in Cambodia does support children with disabilities. And I think there actually may be some participants who are also in this webinar who could answer that question, who are working specifically with the Ministry of Education. And could, so I'd welcome folks who are more plugged into that than we are to chime in on that. Um, and of course, Hung, if you'd want, if you'd like to comment on that, you're welcome as well. Otherwise we'll um, move on to another question. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just quick, yeah. So from my understanding uh, that now the Ministry of Education also developed the uh, policy to support uh, children with ST for their education. So they, they still divide the special education and mainstream education in, in that aspect. And now they introduce the new curriculum uh, that aim to include children with ST into that uh, education system in Cambodia. So that is the initiative that uh, they are trying their best to do. And if though they cannot go to the mainstream, and then they should go to the special school. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, I'm just going down to see additional questions. How are the functional assessment centers engaged to ensure early identification and appropriate placements into educational institutions for those who are of school going age? Hmm. Let's see. So I guess that's about, is that's a question about screening uh, to ensure early identification and appropriate placement into educational institutions. So again, school placement was not a focus of this study, um, but maybe Hung, you could talk a little bit broadly about the screening that's happening through the CBD mat or, and Claire or Betsy could also chime in on that about how are children being screened and then referred for additional uh, support. Okay, so I start first. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. This is my question, but uh, I mean, it's a little bit out of my knowledge uh, in mm -hmm. terms of that, but in terms of the two screening tool that they are introduced in, in Cambodia now, the CDMAT uh, short and long term, a uh, long uh, version, um, they used to identify, identify disability in communities. Uh, so it's still limited for uh, their assessment. Uh, IECD is using it. Uh, some of the NGO local and international NGO also use it. But uh, I don't see that it used in the national uh, initiative yet. Uh, and for the education, uh, I don't believe that they use it for identify children with whether they can go to school or not. 
another tool by the MOH, of course, is uh, to detect the uh, impairment or, or disability from like very early newborn, and then they send for the service only. That is the purpose. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'm seeing a question from Suzanne. Of, this is a little bit of a broader lens. What are some of your suggestions for successfully working cross-sectorally on ECD issues? Um, and I'll just share a few thoughts, and then I'd love to hear from Claire and Betsy and Kat as well, if you have thoughts about this. Um, I'd say a couple of sort of thoughts that come to my mind. One is the importance of having technical leadership teams that are committed to working with other sectors. Uh, it does take creativity and openness to work outside of your own sector. A lot of us are, you know, we're trained in one particular discipline and we are working in that space and we know that language and that way of thinking about problems and other the way that other sectors work can be kind of alienating and different. And so um, when you're managing an integrated program, having uh, technical leaders in their space who are open to conversation and dialogue around looking for opportunities to connect is really important. I also would say identifying low-hanging fruit and making the integration really concrete is important. People often don't know what you mean when you say integrated ECD. They think of it from their own sector, um, and they don't realize that there are some very simple actions you can take within each sector that connect you to other sectors and build towards this broader nurturing care framework, which Claire touched on briefly, but we, we didn't go into in a lot of depth, um, to, to integrate programming that, that doesn't have to be, um, you know, a very heavy lift. There's some low-hanging fruit there. Um, actually, many more thoughts, but I want to give others a chance to chime in. Kat, do you want to go ahead? Sure. I mean, I think the reality is in many places there still weren't learning. How how do we do this well? What does this look like? Um, and I think it's important to recognize the the need for sectors to have those opportunities to communicate and understand kind of the role that each sector has to play. Um, I think to be able to see examples of what what can this look like? How do we you know, go beyond, for example, in health, just the physical growth um, and physical health of a child to broader definitions of health. And, I, you know, this is true, even just thinking about mental health and how that's mm -hmm. a growing movement globally to focus more on this, to think more about well-being. And so, you know, I think under the, I think technical leadership, like you said, Catherine, super, super important to be able to um, be strategic about the role that each sector can play and then opportunities for facilitating that communication, whether that comes from higher level leadership in a government that um, forces it to happen through some sort of coordination body or whatever it might be. But um, we certainly have to get out of our silos and understand more what others are doing, um, what that what that looks like, um, and just open those spaces for communication and, and just recognize that no one sector can do it all. Um, and as we learn and work together better, I think we'll we'll progress, but it, it'll take time and it's a journey. And, and I think many are learning myself included. Thanks, Kat. Um, Claire, Betsy, do you want to add anything on that? Oh, no, I think you guys covered it uh, really well. Thank you both. Just even recognizing, as y'all said, that integration doesn't necessarily have to be a, a big, scary new thing. There's a lot of kind of smaller, easier ways to start making that happen. And so creating space for those conversations and that recognition and kind of that teamwork to start building is really important. So thank you both. Thanks. Okay. I'm a little uh, overwhelmed by the chat at the moment, but let me see. I, one really good one from Olivia is jumping out to me. Are there initiatives in Cambodia that utilize community health workers? And if so, how does the effectiveness of that compare to having people come to health centers themselves, especially in rural provinces, such as Priya Vahir and Kampong Tom? So center health center based care versus community level um i don't know hung would you like to comment on that and i'd welcome input from betsy and others as well on that the community health volunteer model yep so i think Chandni is also in uh, this uh, 
in this uh, webinar. So I'll, I'll try to answer to this question first. Uh, Jenny, you can add if, if you like. Jenny is participant, is working for IECD program. Project, sorry. Yeah, regarding the uh, health support from uh, the community level to the children with T or caregivers, we have the system in Cambodia that set up uh, at the local level. So we have health center and along with health center, we have also uh, village, village health support groups, which is the volunteer in the community at the village level. Uh, by the uh, policy or, or guideline, one village should have two uh, uh, volunteers. Uh, except maybe some village that are uh, large, uh, maybe low uh, uh, population uh, dispersed, then uh, they have more than two. To have, the aim is to have the uh, people in the community, not only children with but uh, I think they are working well uh, in the project that have tried uh, some years ago. Uh, including the IECD project, uh, uh, we, we found that really helpful in terms of transferring, in terms of supporting in the education of children with disability in the community, in terms of bringing information and sharing uh, for like uh, peer meeting or, or other uh, uh, participation as well. But I mean, in terms of knowledge, they still limited. They don't have the skill in uh, caring of children with disability. Uh, these people may be because, uh, I, I think in Cambodia you may may aware that uh, the education is still low. A lot of them are volunteer, they, they, some of them may be not finished primary school, I mean. So you can imagine about that. And of course we can train them if uh, we have a clear and supportive program for caring and for supporting family in the communities. Um, I take example as well, previous uh, project, one of that I, I was working with Handicap International during the time we call uh, this way, now it's called uh, uh, Humanity and Inclusion. They have the early detection project and early uh, intervention project that they form the parent group in the communities and they work closely with this uh, Village health support group, and it was working quite well. Uh, they set up the parent parenting group in community, not only helping and and uh, supporting in terms of exercise, transferring uh, children to other needed service, in, including rehabilitation service, but also in terms of uh, sharing communication uh, with other uh, stakeholders as well. So I think. It does work, but because it was the project based, it's not sustained. And if there is initiative from the government, I think uh, with maybe some support to this volunteer in terms of financial or other, other aspect, maybe it can move forward. But yeah, that's, that's what I, I can see and that's what I, my, uh, uh, previous experience uh, from from early projects. Great, Thanks. thank you, thank you so much. Um, and I'm just realizing that we are at time, so we're going to need to close. And I think we've we've tried to answer questions via chat. Feel free to follow up with us. Um, you can scan this QR code to get on our mailing list for uh, occasional newsletters. We don't bombard anybody, but infrequent communications from our, our team, you can get updates here. We will send um, a follow-up email to everyone who registered for this webinar with a recording of the webinar and the written report on this study. Um, and you'll also find links to the center itself. Uh, and I'm going to just drop a link here into the chat, unless maybe Betsy's already done Done it, but in case not, I'll just drop that into the chat. Thanks everyone so much for joining. I know we're over time. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Hung, Cami, Claire, Betsy. We appreciate all your support. Thanks everyone for joining today. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you for participation. Thank you, Hung. Thanks, Thanks Kat. Hung. Thank Thanks, you, Cammy. everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.